So as uh, I assume everybody knows tonight, our topic is edge feathering. And to start this off, we will just dive into quickly to what is edge feathering. And to start that off, we have to uh, make sure that everyone has the same definition of what we mean by edge. So an, an edge is a place where two habitat, two habitat types meet. Examples are whenever a timber meets a crop field or a timber meets a CRP field. Um, we have a lot of hard edges in Iowa, especially when you start to talk about that timber to crop or that timber to CRP um, junction. Uh, and so the hard edge just means that there's no gradient or there's no shrubby component in between. Um, for more of a simple put phrase, edge feathering is a conservation practice that makes edges more attractive to wildlife because whenever you feather that edge and you kind of have a transition period from a grass and cover type to a forest habitat, habitat type or a um, crop field to a forest habitat type, you're offering more of a full habitat, a full habitat um, picture into more possible suited areas for different kinds of wildlife. Um, okay, so, so a quick example of both of those. Here's a picture of a hard edge. So we have this crop field going into a CRP strip, going into a uh, ditch or a draw of some sort. Um, there's not really any good layering or conjunction between the um, grass and the ditch over here versus this picture where we have a softer edge. This picture in particular, they drop some trees leading to this brushy shrubby look. So now there will be more of a layered look going from, I'm assuming this is going to be a crop field on the left, and then we have some CRP grassland in the middle with some edge feathering on top of it, and that's just to kind of give it that softer edge feathered look. So I work with a lot of people who do edge feathering, and they always ask, you know, what are the benefits of this? Um, for me, it's one of my favorite practices just because it's going to create that, that instant cover for wildlife. And um, you're going to have tons of different species using it. I mainly use it down here in southern Iowa for quail um, and deer. Um, but other species like your pheasants are going to use it. Your cottontail rabbits are going to use it. Um, turkeys are going to use it for nesting. Um, and then up in, in Blake's area, like rough grouse, might even use edge feathered areas, um, especially if they're aspen areas. Um, and then along with that, there's too many to list, but uh, all the different songbirds and migrating birds that are going to migrate through and use those um, shrubby habitat corridors. Um, so with edge feathering, I like it. Like we said, it creates that escape cover uh, for quail. Um, they definitely need something to dive into to get away from predators. Um, it's going to be good nesting cover for your turkeys right on the edges. Um, roosting cover for um, quail throughout the day uh, for loafing areas. Um, roosting for your, your songbirds. And then winter cover is kind of the main one that I like to um, tell people to do edge feathering for just because down here in southern Iowa, last few years we've been having a lot of ice storms. So during those hard winters, that good um, thick shrubby cover is excellent for all your birds to get under there and create that thermal habitat and uh, just get out of the weather and um, keep them all safe from the um, whether it's hawks or um, any other predators. but um, And then, like we said with quail, um, studies have shown, especially in those winter months, that they don't like to move more than 70 feet um, from that shrubby cover. So um, having those edge feathering areas kind of spaced throughout your timber edge um, or even throughout your CRP um, or throughout the field, just so quail can jump around. Um, ideally, you're going to have them every um, 150 feet, 200 feet, just so quail can uh, get out of one, fly to the other, um, just kind of create that habitat continuity and uh, more more usable space. Um, so if we want to hit that next slide. So this is another good uh, example of edge feathering. Uh, I believe this project was just completed. Um, probably, I think it was back in. Um, late March when this one was done. Um, but just kind of showing this one has some crop field and then it had a hard edge right into a, a ravine area. Landowner really wanted to manage for quail. Um, so we had him come in and do heavy edge feathering on the edge. Um, so he was able to drop all those, drop them in. Um, so now he's right next to 
uh, either going to be like a weedy food plot or um, eventually CRP, where we're going to have really good diversity uh, for nesting cover. So um, a lot of people, I guess, whenever they kind of run into this, because this is kind of a more, um, I wouldn't say a more advanced practice, but but when you start, when you start going to edge feathering, this is kind of more of up and beyond your average um, habitat improvement situation. So I guess I've always been asked, like, how do you get started? Um, the first thing I always kind of want people to step back and think about is I kind of want you to um, think about your exact wildlife objectives or your like the exact species that you're trying to benefit on your farm. At the end of the day, it's your property and like we're just here to help you um, amplify that property for your goals. So if you have your goals set, then that just helps us be able to main, to, to uh, square a plan up and make sure that we're all on the same page from the beginning. Um, after that, your best thing, like after like, you, you have an idea of what you want, then the best place is to go find out where to do it. And, and with edge feathering, especially, like I said, it um, a big factor plays into where you see those hard edges. So if you go find your like, if you have a, a large piece of timber, any draws, ditches, anything like that, go find where any of the hard edges are in your property. And that's kind of where these areas of these shrubby slash drop trees can be into, um, can be put into effect. Um, so down in Shane's area, if you're going more of a small game, um, quail, pheasant, rabbit type of thing, you might want to consider doing a little bit of habitat improvements before you actually go in and actually drop the trees. Um, for example, if you have like a brome cool season base, so if you have like an existing like cool season field, like or something or fire break possibly, you might want to terminate that cool season sod form grass underneath where your edge is going to be because that cool season is is going to limit the natural weedy growth of anything that comes up um, through it because that weedy growth is what's going to be um, the food source for the for like especially quail pheasant and songbirds like so whenever you're looking into um, dropping some trees or anything like creating a hard edge you might want to consider kind of dropping that uh, or improving the habitat that is going to be laying on before you start to actually go in and start planting cutting the trees with that same note, you, you, you can go in and disc that same area because when you disc it, you're introducing more of a native weed bank, which weed has a negative connotation, but there are some benefits of certain weeds out there. And mostly, like I said, seeds provide some, the smaller seeds of some of the common weeds around will provide food source to our smaller birds, and our, our smaller game. Um, we can also kind of go into the idea of planting these and that's kind of where on the fourth on the, uh, it's the fifth bullet here. You can kind of talk about where they're um, talking about plums, dogwoods, and gooseberries, stuff like that. So you have to be kind of cognizant of what you want to plant that can also create wildlife via mast or berries, stuff like that, that could be a benefit in the future. Um, once again, just here's kind of an example. You see that they went through and they terminated, the, they terminated the cover of where it was going to be laying. Like I said, we don't want to create good habitat on top of bad habitat. If we're going to go ahead and go through the work of uh, feathering and e like edge feathering, then the idea is to get the best habitat in all around. So that's kind of where we need to better the habitat underneath it and promote the best habitat that's going to come up and create the overall um, friendly environment. And then this is kind of shows that weedy component that would come up or sh will be um, the regrowth after you go through terminate it with either a burn down or you use a disc, like I said, it promotes a weedier um, look and that kind of brings in the seeds that will be a major food source for a small game. And going with those weed species too, I mean, that's perfect brooding habitat. So it's once again, just putting all that habitat together. Um, so now um, how to edge feather, um, you gotta look at where to do it, you know, when to do it, how to cut it, what species do you want to hit, and then how big do you do it? So first we'll start with where, and like it says, it's where it's needed most, but um, that's hard to know sometimes. So everybody I work with, we usually will target um, anywhere that they maybe already have some existing habitat. So maybe they have a CRP field or um, CRP with some crop, and then they got a woody fence line. So those are some areas that I'm probably going to target. Um, just trying to, once again, like we said, hit all those habitat types so they can all be in cl close proximity. 
hopefully within you know 70 feet 80 feet 100 feet of each other just so quail can use them and then when so a lot of people will do their cutting in, in the winter months um for one it's usually a lot cooler if you're out there running a chainsaw it can warm up pretty fast um, there's less vegetation to deal with you can get in get to the base of that tree cut it um, and then you don't have to deal as much with poison ivy um, i still know a few people that cut through it in the winter time i still get it but um, that's one thing we usually will see growing up the tree so um, watch out for that if you are cutting and then the big thing just with that less vegetation you got to be able to see what you're doing um, but another big one too if you are going through some of our federal programs we do have to follow um, some of our threatened and endangered species. Um, so with the Indiana bat, Northern Long-Eared bat, um, we can't cut um, any bat habitat trees um, from April to October. So at least that, when they're gone, that lines up with that perfect time to cut, which would be October through the end of March. And then how do you cut? Everybody I work with down here, they kind of have their own opinions on what they want to do. Um, I don't really mind what they do one way or the other, um, whether they're hinge cutting or if they're going to cut and drop it. Um, I just say if you're going to do both, um, try to keep them somewhat even or, you know, don't don't do it all one way. Um, hinging is great. A lot of people down here like to do that just for their deer so they can get a little bit of that cover on the edge as well. Um, but I found a lot of times, even if you just cut it off right at the stump, um, that you're going to get a lot of regrowth. Um, from your sprout. So you're still gonna get that cover. You're still gonna get some food and nutrition from that. Um, but it's all kind of personal preference, however you feel, um, whether you want to hinge cut or, or, or cut it all the way off. Um, some of our um, more um, kind of like weedy species of trees, if you have anything like um, autumn olive or um, honeysuckle, anything like that, you probably want to cut those all the way off and make sure to treat them just so you're not getting those back. But um, some other species that we like to cut, um, one of my favorites is shingle oak. Um, I know we have a lot of that down here in Southern Iowa, Northern Iowa, you probably don't get as much shingle oak. Um, I'm not sure where that cutoff is, but um, they're definitely my favorite tree to cut just because they seem to grow back really fast and then they'll hold their leaves in the fall. Um, even throughout the winter. So um, that's providing good um, cover. Um, it's going to be good habitat corridor. Uh, the deer seem to love to browse on them. Um, and then they seem to always produce little um, acorns, no matter what kind of year we're having. Um, but other than that, usually we're kind of targeting our um, undesirables, if you want to call them that, like our elm. Um, we have a lot of ash down here, but it's also dying with the ash borer. Um, honey locust. I do have black locust cut or on here, but um, a lot of times I'll shy away from that one now, just because if you cut one, you're going to get like a hundred resprouts, and if that's next to CRP, all those resprouts are going to come up in your CRP area. Um, so that's just going to create a headache throughout that contract because you're going to have to remove all those. Um, and then sometimes even I have people cutting even like white oaks and bur oaks, um, just because they have a big cluster of them, so they're almost doing. A little bit of timber stand improvement with this and when they're kind of selecting that good tree they want to keep and then they'll just cut the others around it um, we also have a lot of cedar trees down here in southern iowa um, i also like to cut those sometimes they're hard because you got to cut four or five limbs to even crawl back in there to the to the um to the base of the tree to cut it off there but um, there's another one that hold the leaves and provide good cover throughout the year and then you're looking to cut around and hopefully trying to release some of our desired wildlife friendly shrubs um, like your American plums, um, nine bark, hazelnut. Um, we have a lot of silky um, and gray dogwood down here in southern Iowa. So those are kind of all those trees that we're trying to release and promote to grow right on your edge. Um, so then how many, how wide and how deep do you cut on the edges? Um, as it says in here, it's almost kind of an art versus a science. So you're kind of picking and choosing those areas. Ideally, we're looking maybe 30 feet by 50 feet wide. Um, 
I know some areas will kind of run the whole length of their, their timber draw um, and we're trying to cut in 50 feet if they can. Um, and I usually will tell people in that first third, try to cut 75 to 90% of those trees. Then that second third, looking at 50 to 75% of the trees that you're cutting. And then that last third, you can drop it down to 35 to 50% of the trees that you're cutting. Um, if you're doing that, you're kind of doing a little bit of that clear cut on the edge and you get that nice gradual transition up. Um, and like it says in there, if you have a farm bill biologist in your area, definitely hit them up. They'll be able to help you out. If not, we also have great partners with the DNR. Um, they have uh, wildlife biologists, private lands biologists, and um, wildlife specialists throughout the state. So I think at the very end, we have a map with some people. Um, but yeah, there's always somebody in your area that you can reach out to for help on this if you need it. And if it's your first time, you can cut some, call us out, we can look at it. We can tell you, yes, that looks good. Um, or no, you need to cut a little bit more. And kind of like it says on there, you can always cut more, but you can't stand them back up. So um, yeah, just one thing to keep in mind. So we have within our program, I guess we have light edge feathering and heavy edge feathering. So this would kind of be that example of light. Um, maybe this one you're going through and you're only cutting four, five, six trees in an area, kind of dropping them, creating some down tree structures and areas, um, just kind of scattered throughout that, that tree line there. Where our next one will be heavy edge feathering. So that's kind of a little bit more what I was talking about where you're cutting upwards of 90 to 100% of the trees right on the edge, um, just creating almost like that clear cut effect right on that first third of your, your tree line. Um, and that really creates a lot of habitat. Um, I think I checked this one just a few weeks after it was cut. This was, I wanna say it was in December. Um, and I walked the edge and just even a few weeks after being cut, the deer were already up on there browsing off all the buds on it. So um, that instant habitat is definitely true on this. So, um... So as we talked about earlier, um, it's great to combine this with a, an overall habitat improvement or like just add this to an additional field that's already being um, either established or is going to be established into habitat to kind of, to kind of create an entire, um, an entire habitat niche or like click of everything all works well together. So in, the, in this example, and this is a producer I work with personally, this field as you, the field you see to the north of this woodlot is going into a CR, it's, it's in CRP, it's going to be um, a, like a prairie restoration plus upland bird habitat field, then their process of being established. So in the planning process, I was working with the owners, they're big pheasant hunters, and they want the best population they can have out there moving forward and a big part of that is especially on this farm that they, they already had some they had some grass and they were um they are farmers so they have plenty of um available food during most parts of the year but they were they were lacking a lot of winter habitat they had a lot of mature stands of forest and then they had just fields and so we kind of like i guess i work closely with them to come up with a plan of we could either plant shrubs and trees and the right picture here like you can see the zones we could plant shrubs and trees, kind of square off this field, fill in this area, because in theory, this area would be the first to um, get those trees naturally anyway. So we could plant some wildlife friendly shrubs and whatnot in there. Um, and that would kind of create that feathered edge once they um, grow and take off, because the shrubs are gonna be a smaller plant and a smaller height than the forest, but they're, they're all kind of intermingle um, once they get mature and become a big grove of then they will all kind of intermingle into one larger habitat type. And then, or we could go into this finger up here, we could go in here and start trimming and dropping trees as Shane alluded to earlier. Um, we kind of go through, we pick what trees are less desirable and which trees would be better for mass, um, for like deer, for deer browse or something like that. Or we could just look at the options for possible, um, logging or money operations stuff like that like you don't want to kind of target your valuable trees you want to target more of the possible trees that will open up and release your better opportunities 
So this instance, we decided to go with the tree release instead of the tree instead of the shrub planting, just because they it was kind of already a finger there that was, um, by itself and was kind of already an awkward well, not awkward. It was already an isolated piece of habitat where versus when they go in there and they drop those, then you're creating an edge feathered finger going up out of there and you're creating that pheasant winter habitat as well as a bedding habitat for deer and all that stuff. And this was just well and and this worked out well because they reached out before they started actually operating out there. And so we were able to plan it up off all their objectives and get there. We we're all on the same page. So we could all be able to plan this and that way we were able to have max CRP acres mixed max um, habitat on the woodlot and going through and helping create a forestry plan for the rest of that. We were, we were able to combine all the, all the different programs into one because we had plenty of time to get ahead of it and plan. So I kind of mentioned earlier that uh, we do have cost share available for this uh, with some of our federal programs. Um, the main one that I work with is going to be our EQIP program, which is our Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Um, it's, a, it's probably one of my favorite programs just because we can do just about anything you want with it. But um, I do a lot with, with edge feathering through that. It has a pretty high cost share rate right now, um, but it does a lot of work. So um, you definitely earn every every penny of that. Um, and then some of our CRP practices will even allow edge feathering now. Um, I know there's a couple with, um, I think it's, we have like a quail safe that will be able to do edge feathering. Um, or I think our like CP25s, we can do some shrub plantings on it. So it's similar to that. Um, but yeah, that's one. If you're thinking about it, you should ask your either FSA office or your NRCS contact about that. And, and they'll be able to let you know, because um, those rules are always kind of changing a little bit. So um, just make sure that it's allowed before you go out and do it. Um, but yeah, if you have questions on it, if you're thinking about doing it, definitely head over to your local USDA office, um, talk to the NRCS. Um, if you have Pheasants Forever there or Iowa DNR, um, just visit with any of them. They'll be able to point you in the right direction. Uh, most likely we'll come out to the field with you, look at it, talk through it, come up with a great plan for you and, and help you out along the way. And if you do decide to go the cost share route, like I said, I would highly recommend you kind of like um, get your ducks in a row and get get the conversations and the planning done earlier than later because once you kind of get it gets once you get your seeding plan developed and your seed vault and stuff like that it can get kind of difficult to come in here and expect to be able to change like a crp um, plan to include shrubs it can be difficult depending on the situation that we're in to kind of change things up at the last moment on a few of these plantings i'll um, mention one more one more thing on that um i forgot to mention with equip um we usually will take all of our applications once a year um so depending on when you apply for it, you almost have to plan a year in advance for it um, just to follow with those bat nesting dates and, and timings for cutting. So um, that's another thing to keep in mind. Sometimes you're almost planning the year in advance. Um, so yeah, just, just remember that. So the edge feathering maintenance, well, to be quite honest with you, um, there's not much, if any, maintenance needed uh, for some or most of these projects. It's kind of a lot of it is, especially if you do the um, dropping of, like, the cutting of trees, dropping of trees. You just kind of want to watch and see what what things grow, and um, just watch the shrubs and the vegetation that's coming up, and then you kind of want to monitor it see if there's any way that you could possibly improve it, or um, see if there's anything that's more beneficial than other things to the wildlife. Um, obviously, just kind of, especially in the early years, especially if you go that disc route or that spraying route, you might have some thistles depending on your areas or some undesirable trees, like Shane mentioned, if you cut some locusts, something like that, just make sure that you don't have those undesirables coming back if you're trying to weed those out through that. And then also, once you drop them, you will have to start eventually evaluating them later down the line to see what will what we'll need edge feathered again later especially if you start dropping trees. Unfortunately, things do deteriorate. So if you drop a couple of trees, if, if you drop trees to 
um, edge feather, then you will have to eventually go back and probably drop more somewhere else. So just over time, they will naturally start to break down and just become less, less, less and less habitat every year. And then if you do like the, the planting options, then just kind of monitor it to see um, basically what gets eaten or knocked down by deer or wildlife, something like that. Just kind of monitor it and hope that you, and just do your best to maintain it until it become a full successful edge. Um, and then lastly, this is just kind of more of a programmatic situation. Um, going into whenever we, we want to start combining these with CRP or any other planting like that, you want to start or you want to avoid getting any fires from some CRP management burns or you, really, or you don't want to drop it on CRP acres. So I guess the, the big one that I, was, I usually want people about is when you start dropping trees, make sure they're not on CRP acres for one, compliance, and two, um, a lot of times we recommend the use of prescribed burning for maintenance or just like the routine efforts of grassland uh, management. And obviously these larger woody plants that are either growing and or being dropped on this grassland habitat are a, a different fuel type. And depending on when you burn and depending on the fuel conditions, um, things can get a bit more dangerous or a bit more interesting if you allow a fire to jump into a full-size dead tree that transitions into a forest. So you just want to be aware and just kind of be on your toes when you start burning around things like that, doing your best to keep it out of it. And also, if you don't burn through them, then you might have a little bit longer life because when you burn, you're like naturally breaking the tree down more. So you have a longer life to your edge if you can avoid running any fire or any extra disturbance across it. Because at the end of the day, we're dropping it for habitat. And this is kind of one of the habitat types that less disturbance will be more beneficial in the long run until you have to go back through and start redoing or more start improving it somewhere else. And so here's just kind of another example that we that we uh, have worked with. This in particular, I believe is um, down in Shane's area, isn't it? Yeah, yep. So this was so, landowner we worked with. Um, this is kind of what that before, that hard edge that we talk about. Um, we got that crop field or food plot there on the right. And then this was a fence row here with the timber behind it. Um, so it's a really hard edge. Those trees were, um, I don't know, 30, 40 feet tall um, and get taller as you go back into the timber. So on the next slide, it's not the same exact area, but it's on the same field. Um, those tall trees in the back are, is that fence line that was in the previous picture. So that's kind of what this whole edge looked like prior to them cutting. Um, and it is kind of dark, it's an overcast day, unfortunately, but um, you can kind of see how we, he cut the edge and he dropped the trees. Um, some of it are into that food plot and some are right on the edge. So in my mind, that's the perfect habitat just because you're gonna have a little bit of grassy area kind of on the edge of the food plot into the timber. Um, but then you got that good brush habitat right next to the food. Um, so anything like your quail or pheasants, um, even rabbits and that, they're, they're going to go out into that food source and not have to go more than that 70, 70 feet that we talked about earlier. So um, just putting the, the bedroom next to the kitchen, as a lot of people will say, um, is kind of what we're looking for. And, and just creating that gradual transition back into our timber. Um, so quail, um, that's one I guess we've we've talked a lot about. Um, I definitely love managing for it down here in southern Iowa. Um, that's why I promote edge feathering a lot, um, just because it's one of those habitat types I feel like we're we're kind of missing um, in most of the parts here. We have a lot of CRP, um, but we kind of um, our succession has kind of gone to that far right edge where we're into our mature timbers now, um, so we don't have that shrubby component. So um, working with a lot of people to go back in, cut the edge of those trees like this right here. Um, this landowner uh, worked with him on several other CRP projects. Um, he was really interested in deer, um, but the more I talked to him, he, he kind of liked quail and, and started to realize if you manage for quail, it's going to uh, benefit his deer habitat as well. So um, we decided to sign him up for edge feathering through our EQIP program. Um, this was just um, a woody draw that came out into a CRP field. Um, so he went around, cut pretty heavy on the edges. Um, it was mainly like ash and elm um, with some honey locust trees in there as well. 
So it's cutting those undesirable trees, um, dropping those right on the edge. Uh, so this one, he had established CRP, as you can see, and that's what I think is excellent quail habitat. He's got a pretty diverse native seeding right next to a shrubby cover. And it's kind of hard to see, but kind of up on that ridge line. Um, he also has an early successional habitat where he, he went really heavy on uh, sorghum and buckwheat. Um, so that's going to provide um, that winter food, um, good brooding area. And then you got your winter habitat there that's all within 70 to 100, probably 150 feet at the most uh, within each other. So those quail can really move around, feel safe, um, protected from weather, protected from predators. Um, so that's just everything that we're looking for. Uh, same thing with pheasants. Um, up in the northern country, your edge feathering, shrub plantings, um, hedgerow, windbreaks, all that stuff. It's kind of doing the same habitat type. It, it's creating that brushy cover that we're looking for, and that's going to really help and improve your, your overall winter habitat. Um, seems like the last four or five years, uh, we've had some pretty harsh winters. Um, whether it was that blizzard, you know, three or four years ago up in northern Iowa, um, to the ice storms last couple of years down here in southern Iowa. Just more of that brushy habitat that you can put on the landscape. It's going to help those pheasants um, just that much more that they can always get into it. Um, and ideally, once again, if you can put that close to a food source, even better. Um, but yeah, just having it there is, is quite valuable. Um, one aspect we can touch on that's kind of unique to my part of the world up here in Northeast um is we have some rough rough grouse that um we have as a collective in this area between all of our partners dnr um and all the private lands people that involved with habitat have been working on is um the improvement of rough rough grouse habitat they are a very edge dependent um, species they like to live in that very early successional forest growth um kind of very thick early timber environment. Um, and up here in our neck of the woods, we have a lot of aspen trees and a big part of trying to get this habitat back is doing aspen releases or aspen um, cuttings. And, and, and in these photos, you can kind of see, especially along this hillside here in Alamakee County, they dropped a bunch of these aspens. And that's kind of the way that you release aspens is you drop them and then they will sprout and they will grow from where they originally were. And so you have to kind of like look at this hillside and then you can see on the right picture, the picture on the right that where they were dropped, you can start to see them start to sprout back up. And like I said, so where grouse especially have to depend on a very high, um, a very high stem count per acre or, or a very high tree per acre count to kind of in their um, natural um, best environment. And like I said, our numbers up in this part of the world are low at best for rough grouse, especially in the majority of the area. So it's really crucial to kind of start introducing this edge habitat, especially up in our neck of the woods, because this is a resource that is um, in a bit of a decline. And we are in, um, in most parties up here are in trying to get it back at all costs. And this is kind of where the edge feathering is uh, easily applied because it's the aspens are naturally here. We can drop them and we can just naturally kind of bring the habitat back easier than having to go in there and plant them or easier than having to go in there and try to restore a, a whole bunch of um, acres on all this habitat, on all this like upland bird grassland habitat. Like we just got to go and trim our edges that are already there and try to make suitable habitat for them to utilize in the future. Um, and as you can see um, by this last slide here, We've already kind of hit on this quite a bit that this is this kind of a general wildlife improvement situation. There's a whole, is a whole, I mean, probably almost every piece of wildlife that you will see, not every member of the wildlife groups in your area will somewhat find a way to, to benefit from this. Going into turkeys and songbirds, um, it's great nesting habitat, especially when we start dropping some of these trees into some form of grassland habitat. Turkeys like to um, nest kind of in a, more brushy safe environment obviously because they're trying to protect themselves same with deer bedding and then um fawning you'll have them in the kind of brushy habitat where there's less likely um there's going to be any form of disturbance or predation um something else that Shane kind of touched on earlier when you drop these trees um you kind of bring the leaves down to them you allow for this 
um, new browse slash food source that they normally wouldn't have available. On top of that, you're, especially if you start dropping trees or cutting trees, then you're opening up that canopy and that's allowing more sunlight into the um, forest floor or to the edge of your field. And then that's gonna bring in more weeds that will be more palatable or you start bringing in more um, shrub species that will put on more leaves, more buds, more things that will just kind of create an overall new or better food source than what a mature forest next to a crop field slash um, grassland field will provide. And then also this can kind of go without saying that um, just having more structure and more habitat on the ground will protect from predators, especially when we start talking about the juvenile side of things, when we start talking about um, fawns, we start talking about uh, chicks of upland birds, of any kind of birds. Just having that structure to go hide in can um, really just kind of help boost your numbers in your area, especially if you are on a large piece of property or if a bunch of people in your area kind of start making a complex of great habitat all around, then you start to build some wildlife from the, uh, start building better wildlife numbers kind of in your area, and then hopefully that can expand out. And then as Shane kind of alluded to earlier, um, if there, there's not really any science to it. It's kind of all kind of what you want to, kind of what you feel comfortable with, and you, and you can always add to more. Um, there's some guys that will take it to the extremes and they start dropping trees and, and making funnels for deer hunting purposes, or they start making this habitat in ditches where they know that they'll be able to pheasant hunt the next fall. Like you can start creating kind of a wildlife friendly and manipulative environment if you do feel so. If not, then you just create some great habitat that will um, hopefully boost numbers and just be great for all things for the future. Um, and we alluded to this earlier. We alluded to this earlier, if you start cutting trees, especially start going into some of your more um, hardwood species, we're just gonna recommend that you go to our partners and DNR, especially the private land foresters. Um, especially if you start combining, like Shane was talking about equip programs. If you start going into mixing some timber stand improvement on the whole scale, um, it's just best to kind of get a professional foresters recommendation. Um, we'll be happy to help, but if it's kind of above um, our knowledge or if it's in conjunction with a program where they have the better uh, judgment, then we will probably refer you to at least their advice or suggestions. Um, at this point in time, we'll be taking any questions in the chat or you guys can unmute yourselves and ask questions if you would prefer to do that. I can't see the chat box. Is there anything in it? Um, I'm not seeing any. Hopefully I'm looking at the right area. If you guys have one in the chat that we're not seeing, uh, just unmute your mic there. Um, otherwise, I'd say we covered it pretty well. But um, I know I didn't have it in, in time for this meeting, but um, I'm hoping to work with a landowner in the future just to kind of get a good video of this. Um, I would like to go out with our camera and kind of show them actually cutting, um, maybe explaining why they're doing it and this and that. So um, hopefully I'll have that here. We're kind of through our cutting season now, but hopefully this next fall I'll get on that. Um, so at least we have all your, your contact info. Um, you have ours based off this map. Um, yeah, just feel, re feel free to reach out to us if you have questions um, or if you're wanting the more pictures or videos in the future, just, just reach out to us and we'll get to you. Other than that, I guess if we don't have any more questions, I just want to say thank you for joining and um, spending the evening with us. Um, I'm sure you guys are all probably happy to be inside in the air conditioning right now with the weather we have, but um, yeah, I just want to say thank you again. Thank you all. Are you recording or did you cut it off?
All righty. I think we'll log off here.